you know, we've danced around the gold rush a bit. That must have had such a significant impact in the influx of of migrants moving west. Um, you know, everyone really knows the story of the gold rush. Gold is found and there's this boom. But I want to talk about the boom and bust towns, the little mining towns that popped up um, and then died away quickly once everything was mined. What's what, what are boom and bust towns? Well, uh, you know, a boom and bust town, um, it, if there's a gold strike and it in re- reports initially or, well, usually, usually, Jake, I mean, for California, uh, newspapers and, and reports made it seem like there were just big nuggets laying on the ground. You didn't, you didn't even have to work for it, um, which wasn't the case, but it draws all these, you know, if somebody does make a rich strike and let's say there's several rich strikes in a very small area, well, these guys, you know, they've got to live somewhere, you know, they're camping out near their stake. And then there's a town um, that's got a merchant, you know, saloon supplying all their needs. And suddenly, you know, you've got a Virginia city, uh, you've got a tombstone, Arizona, you've got a Deadwood, South Dakota. um, And, uh, you know, some of them lasted and some of them didn't. Um, you know, Tombstone was was huge for just a few years. Um, and then, um, you know, there was flooding in the mines. It, you know, they, they couldn't get the water pumped out uh, as it needed to be. And uh, Tombstone became a tourist stop instead of a, a boom town uh, where its focus was on the past and not on its future. But, you know, it's not just the mining towns that are boom towns. Other kinds of boom towns had to do with the cattle drives. So in the 1860s and 70s, after the Civil War, um, there's all these Texas cattle, I mean, you know, amazing, huge herds. um, And they're being driven north to the closest railroad terminal. And one of the very first, I mean, an incredible boom town was Wichita, Kansas. Um, But that boom town only lasted a few years because uh, the railroad moves westward. And also, the state of Kansas had what they called a deadline. Uh, there was a disease that they were afraid would infect the cat, their uh, local cattle. And so they wouldn't let the Texas herds go east of that line. Well, that deadline was moved. Not only did the railroad go west, but the deadline moved west. And so um, you have other towns that are boom towns. And so, for instance, Dodge City, it takes up where Wichita left off. Now, Wichita had the benefit. I mean, it's in the middle of farm country. Uh, It's still a a major city today, uh, so it didn't die. On the other hand, Dodge City, uh, which was an incredible boom town for a few years because of the cattle trade, um, it uh, isn't anything like it was uh, historically. I mean, it's still a significant town, but it's not it it isn't booming like it was in the 1870s when all these cattle and, and thousands and thousands of head of cattle were being loaded at those yards and all these cowboys they get paid off at the end of the drive. And so, you know, there's no other place to spend your money except right there in Dodge City. And there's the saloons, there's the prostitutes. But hey, if you want a nice pair of boots, there's boot makers. If you want a holster, uh, you want a fancy hat. I mean, all those things are, are being sold uh, at this end of the trail drive. So so there's all kinds of boom towns in the West. And I mean, you could even talk about the energy today. Uh, there's boom towns that kind of cycle with uh, whatever the price of natural gas or or um, what is it that uh, shale or whatever they happen to be mining, um, you know, depending on what the market is, things are booming. People are moving to North Dakota or whatever, and and then it's and then it kind of settles down a little bit, and and businesses are struggling, and that boom bust is just is still with us. It never left. Yeah, one of the things I was delighted to learn quite recently is that some of these boom towns are ghost towns now still with the old infrastructure from you know the wild west era that boomed and then were just abandoned and that that old infrastructure is still there i would love to visit some of those have you ever been able to visit some of those ghost towns yeah i've been to a few i'm not really a ghost town person there are people i mean there's jake there's ghost town clubs okay and they go and they go to different ghost towns in the mountains of Colorado and, and El- I mean, there's books, the ghost towns of New Mexico, ghost towns of Colorado. I mean, uh, yeah, the people are just as fascinated by that, uh, as you are. And some towns, um, 
or I guess I would call them semi ghost towns. I'll give you an example. So in New Mexico in Lincoln County, the county seat was Lincoln, New Mexico. Now the railroad didn't build into Lincoln. It built into Cotizozo. And once Lincoln was no longer the county seat, there's no reason to go there. I mean, people have to go to the county seat to pay their taxes or or file a deed for land or what have you. So they're not getting that traffic. And what happens is, is that a town like Lincoln gets, I guess you would call it forgotten. Um, it just kind of stops. And so today when you go there, I mean, it has very few people living there. Several of the buildings belong to the state. It's part of a state historic site. But you get a real feel uh, for what it was like when Billy the Kid was there and Pat Garrett uh, in the late 70s, early 1880s, um, because those buildings were preserved. And, and you know, there were, because it stopped as the county seat, there's no more construction. So you're not knocking down buildings. They all just remain in place. So to me, that's kind of my favorite ghost town where, um, the buildings, you're not just seeing the shells, you're actually seeing the buildings themselves. Uh, but like I say, it, time kind of forgot it. And so, uh, it's a, I'd say it's a very well preserved old West town. Wow. That is so cool. I would love to visit some of those one day. It's also probably really eerie. I mean, it's called a ghost town for a reason. Um, we have, we have a hunting lease in Georgia and it's kind of in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, but it used to be a plantation way back in the day. And the main house from the plantation is still, still there. So it was this house that was built during like the civil war and all, all the panels of the house, you can tell they were like, you know, hand done. There was no machinery. So it's, it's not perfectly even you. And they have like old hinges on the door still. So it's still pretty much preserved, but being in that house is so eerie. I don't know. There's just something about being in a really, old house that has seen a lot of history that is just it's so interesting my brother actually has a story because we used to actually stay in the house because it was actually very well kept um and he claims that that one night in the middle of the night you know he's sleeping there and he heard footsteps in the hall or something and he asked my dad the next morning like hey did you were you up in the middle of the night and he's like no it's 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 so eerie well it's you know those abandoned buildings and one, one is as far as you know, as far as far as abandoned uh, places, but that have remnants. My one of my favorites is Fort Union in New Mexico, and this was a very large military post. Um, it was the hub. Your goods are shipped over the Santa Fe Trail. They're taking these giant warehouses at Fort Union, and then they're distributed to the military posts throughout the Southwest. So Fort Union was an important uh, installation, uh, and there were lots of soldiers there, lots of buildings. But every building is now, it's just these remnants of these adobe walls and windows. And so it, it speaks to what you're saying is that when you when you visit a place like that, it's it's fodder for your imagination. Um, you know, it's it's quaint, it's archaic. Um, and and you you know, your your imagination can go wild. You know, it, it puts you in the right frame of mind when you're in a ruin, uh, whether it's a ruined castle or a ruined fort. Um, and, 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 you know, and it's a completely different experience as opposed to going into a restored historic home. And that's just as fun to me because you're, especially if it has original furnishings or whatever, but, uh, but yeah, there's, uh, you're getting that ghostly vibe in those, uh, the ruins. Yeah. That's such a beautiful way to put it fodder for the imagination. Cause that is what, what makes it so cool and so fun is you can imagine and visualize what would have happened you know, in this room, you know, 150 years ago when this house was standing, who, who would have been walking through here? What would they have been doing? I, speaking of historical homes that have been preserved, when I was in California a couple of weeks ago, I went to the Reagan ranch, Ronald Reagan's home in Santa Barbara. And that was so cool because the cool thing about the Reagan ranch and the Reagan home is he sold it to the Young America's Foundation right before he died. And when they inherited it, they didn't touch a single thing. So when you go to Mount Vernon, for example, there's maybe like ropes around stuff. And this is like, hey, this is what a dining room would have looked like back when George Washington was living here. But the cool thing about the Reagan Ranch and, and Reagan's home is that nothing has been touched at all. 
So there's still books laying on the tables from when he was reading them. They still literally have his soap in the shower oh. that he was using. <laughs> okay. It's incredible. There's no ropes around anything. So you're walking through his house and you know I'm standing in the guy's bedroom and nothing's been touched. So it literally feels like he's just out at the grocery store, maybe out riding his horse and he's going to come back any minute. It's so weird to be like standing in the guy's bedroom and like this is literally where Ronald Reagan was sleeping. And it, it it was it really was an incredible experience. Well, who who maintains that or who owns that? The Young America's Foundation. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Was it? Did they purchase it or was it donated to them? Or yeah, I I, I believe they purchased it because Ronald Reagan, um, he was like the honorary chair of YAF, um, you know, before his presidency and for a very very long time. He was he was very. It's a conservative organization. Um, so they were very involved with each other. And when they sold the ranch, they wanted it to be preserved and they knew Yaf would, would do a good job at preserving that. So when they bought it, they didn't touch anything. So, you know, right, there's a hill right next to the house, like 20 yards away. And they still have the old secret service command post up there. And you're walking through there and they still have like the gun cabinet with these old shotguns that the secret service would have been using. And they have the the red phone that would have had a direct, direct line right next to the, the, there's one next to the president's bed and one in the secret service command post. Like it's all, all the same computer equipment from the eighties and nineties. It is so cool. Oh, wow. That I'd love to see that. Well, last month I had to make a road trip um, to the Midwest and I'd never been inside of Abraham Lincoln's home. And so we stopped in Springfield and we took the tour and it was just as, just as incredible as what you're describing because, um, Many of the furnishings were actually there when Lincoln lived there before he left for Washington D.C. And it was cool because they, uh, when when Lincoln was campaigning for president, uh, there was uh, I guess, and I can't remember which I don't know what Illustrated Weekly or whatever it was, but um, you know they did a kind of a what you would call a profile on, on the candidate, and they did um, pictures, their engravings of the main rooms in the house. And so the Park Service blew up these pictures so you can see how identical, you know, of course, they made it a point of trying to make it identical. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it literally looks like, I mean, Lincoln would walk in and not really notice anything different. Um, and what was kind of fun was that uh, they said over the years, um, the Lincolns would have kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, they would have a sale. You know, if they got tired of some furniture, they would have a day where people could come over and, you know, they oh, we're going to sell this little whatnot uh, shelf or whatever. Well, a lot of those people, once it, you know, once it was acquired by the state, they brought those things back. There's like a desk that Lincoln had gotten. He had given it to somebody or, or sold it or whatever. And that came back and just various things. And um, anyway, uh, uh, so everything is very very well documented as, as having belonged to the Lincolns at one time. And, and they have it set up. I mean, it looks just like those engravings uh, inside. It's, it's really a, it's a excellent, excellent restoration and, and it's very well preserved. That's so incredible. I urge everyone to, to go do something like that. Maybe a historical figure or event or place that you're interested in, go and experience these well-preserved because our National Park Service and all these organizations do a very good job at preserving this sort of stuff. I, I've i been to um, Robert E. Lee's home, the Arlington House at Arlington National Cemetery. That's pretty well preserved. It's just it's incredible to walk through these old establishments that have seen so much history. There's actually, I don't know if it's the real desk or maybe a recreation, but we were walking through and this the tour guide pointed out like that's the desk that Robert E. Lee sat at when he declined Abraham Lincoln's offer to serve with the Union Army. Oh, wow. Was that at Arlington? Yeah, it's at the Arlington House, yeah. Okay. I, I was, I've been in there. I, I don't remember that, but it was several years ago. I'm, I'm, sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's still, it was there then if it's there now. So, Yeah, there's like, at the Arlington National Cemetery, the house is up on the hill, overlooking the entire city of dc it's tr truly a beautiful view because it's a military you know vantage point where you can oversee everything and that's why the union army took it at the outbreak of the civil war because they didn't want the confederates um having artillery angles down at the city <laughs> <laughs>